This is Dr. Frestin Lim Sako, and in Module 7, we will discuss both sampling in qualitative research and data collection in qualitative research. For this particular presentation, I will discuss sampling in qualitative research. This is part of our lecture series in Nursing Research 1. This module describes sampling approaches used by qualitative researchers. Sampling in qualitative studies is quite different from those in quantitative studies. So in qualitative studies, sampling uses small, non-random samples. However, this does not mean that qualitative researchers don't care about the quality of their study samples. Rather, Qualitative researchers use different considerations when selecting participants who will strengthen the study findings. So it's very important that you select participants who will strengthen your qualitative study findings. So what is the logic behind qualitative sampling? The purpose of most qualitative studies is to discover meaning and to uncover multiple realities. Unlike quantitative studies, qualitative research is not conducted to generalize findings to a population. Generalizability is not the main concern of qualitative research, but transferability. The goal of most qualitative research studies is to provide a contextualized understanding of human experience through the intensive investigation of a few cases. Sampling decisions, therefore, are not guided by a desire to generalize to a target population. Take note of this, it is not quali qualitative data itself that must have a direct impact on decision makers, but the insights they foster in relation to the problem under investigation. It is important to shape the opinion of decision makers whose actions affect the people's health and well-being. Transferability involves judgments about whether the study findings from an inquiry can be extrapolated to a different setting or a group of people. So for you to do this effectively, you need to have what is called thick description, which is the thorough depictions of research settings and, and the sample of the study participants or events. So this thick description is needed in qualitative reports to support the transferability of the study. In your research proposal, you will need to describe this in Chapter 3 under Research Rigor. So in my dissertation, for example, on the meaning of nurse caring for persons sustained with technologies at the end of life, I created an audit trail, prepared a thick description of the chosen research method, and I established the inclusion and exclusion criteria of the sample participants, as well as provided detailed information on the data collection methods and the data analysis techniques. Data collection methods will be discussed next, and data analysis as part of Module 8 will be discussed next week. So, how do you choose the study sample for qualitative research? Well, qualitative researchers need to establish the kinds of people who are eligible to participate in their research. It is important to determine that the participant or the person has experienced the phenomenon if it's a phenomenal phenomenology study or experienced the culture if it's an ethnographic study or experienced the process if it's a grounded theory research that is under investigation so additionally some practical issues when selecting the criteria for the sample participants need to be considered such as costs accessibility and health constraints and i would like to add 
the current restrictions, health risks, and safety precautions required during this COVID-19 pandemic. And here is a sample of eligibility criteria in a qualitative study. There are uh, several different approaches to sampling in qualitative research and one of this is convenience sampling where qualitative researchers often begin with this kind of strategy or convenience in a uh, convenience sampling strategy and is this is also sometimes called um, volunteer sample so volunteer samples are especially likely to be used when researchers need to have participants um, coming forward willingly and identify themselves Sampling by convenience is easy, but it is not a preferred sample or sampling approach even in qualitative studies. Another is snowball sampling. With snowball sampling, qualitative researchers like quantitative researchers sometimes use uh, this strategy, asking early informants to refer other study participants. And with an introduction from the, the person referring or referring person, researchers may have an easier time establishing a trusting relationship with the new participants. Another great thing about snowball sampling is that researchers can more readily specify the characteristics that they want new participants to have. For example, in the study of uh, health workers with COVID-19, the researchers could ask early informants if they knew anyone else who had the same problem and who was verbally expressive. So the researchers could also ask for referrals to people who would add new dimensions to the sample, such as people who vary in age, race, socioeconomic status, and so on. The third type of qualitative sampling is purposive sampling. With purposive sampling, qualitative sampling may begin with volunteer informants and may be supplemented with new participants through snowballing. But many qualitative studies eventually evolve to a purposive or purposeful sampling strategy and that is selecting specific cases that will most benefit the study so more there are more than a dozen purposive sampling strategies um, being identified and i would like you to read chapter 23 of holiday and back 2020 to know more about these other strategies that illustrate the diverse approaches qualitative researchers have used Theoretical sampling is a type of purposive sampling, but Pollitt and Beck described this strategy separately because of its importance in grounded theory. According to Glasser in 1978, the, uh, theoretical sampling is the process of data collection for generating theory whereby the analysis or the, an the analyst jointly collects codes and analyzes his data and decides what data to collect next and where to find them in order to develop the theory as it emerges. So most notably, theoretical sampling supports the constant comparative method that is a key feature of grounded theory research. So theoretical sampling is used in grounded theory research. One guiding principle that is often used is data saturation. That is sampling to the point that at which no new information is obtained and redundancy is achieved. The goal here is to generate enough in-depth data to illuminate the patterns, categories, and dimensions of the phenomenon being studied. Redundancy and hence sample size can be affected by the type of sampling strategy used. 
Um, Morse 2000 noted that the number of participants needed to reach saturation actually depends on several factors. One factor concerns the scope of the research question. The broader the scope, the more participants are likely to be needed. Now, data quality can also affect sample size. If participants, for example, are very good informants and who can reflect on their experiences and communicate effectively, saturation can be achieved with a relatively small sample. And I, I know of uh, a qualitative study that had only three participants and the researcher was able to come up with uh, data saturation as small as three sample uh, in that study. One final suggestion that may be especially important for beginning researchers is to test whether data saturation has been achieved. In my experience with my dissertation, I thought I reached data saturation with a fifth informant. Essentially, I decided to add one more case after achieving inf informational redundancy to ensure that no new information emerges. It turned out that another new information emerged with the sixth participant, and so I then decided to add two more cases to ensure data saturation. You may also do the same in your proposed qualitative research study. There are similarities among the various qualitative traditions with regards to sampling. These are samples are small, probability sampling is not used, and the final sampling decisions uh, usually take place during data collection. And however, there are also some differences. Now for ethnography, key informants are chosen purposively and guided by the ethnographer's informed judgments. Sampling in ethnography typically involves more than selecting informants because observation and other means of data collection actually play important role in helping researchers understand a culture. For phenomenologic studies, phenomenologies tend to rely on very small samples, typically just 10 to 15 participants. And one key principle guides sample selection for a phenomenologic study, and that is all participants must have experienced the phenomenon and must be able to articulate what it is like to have lived that experience. Although phenomenologic researchers seek participants who have had targeted experiences, they also want to explore diversity of individual experiences. So they may specifically look for people with demographic or other differences who have shared a common experience. Grounded theory research is typically done with samples of about 20 to 30 people using theoretical sampling. The goal in a grounded theory study is to select informants who can best contribute to the evolving theory. So in summary, sampling in qualitative inquiry may begin with a convenience or a volunteer sample. Snowball chain sampling may also be used. Qualitative researchers often use purposive sampling to select data sources that enhance information richness. Other strategies used for comparative purposes include homogeneous sampling, uh, deliberately reducing variation. A guiding sample size principle is data saturation. Sampling to the point at which no new information is obtained and redundancy is achieved. Factors affecting sample size include the data quality, researcher skills and experience, and scope and sensitivity of the problem. Transferability involves judgments about whether findings from an inquiry can be extrapolated to a different setting or group of people. I would like to end this presentation with a quote, a goal without a plan is just a wish. So make a good research sampling plan 
to achieve your research aim. Please post your questions on the open forum activity at your sole virtual classroom or you may email your professor. Thank you.